Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first session of the Distinguished Fellows in Conversation series. I'm Connie, and I'm very honored to be hosting our first session today. Through this series, we will feature our Distinguished Fellows who will be sharing with us the life experiences and philosophies as a leader in their respective fields and the key oh, sorry, challenges they have encountered throughout their careers and how they overcame it. Today, we are very honoured to have with us Engineer Lee Chuan Singh. Engineer Lee, how are you today? I'm good and I hope everyone's keeping well at home. Right, so before we begin the segment, please allow me to give a short introduction on our distinguished guest today. So Engineer Lee is the Meritus Chairman of Becker Asia with more than 30 years of experience in the industry. He's currently Chairman of the National Environment Agency of Singapore and has been a part of several boards and committees as advisor or member, including the Building and Construction Authority, um, Professional Engineers Board, Singapore Green Building Council, World Green Building Council and Real Estate Developers Association of Singapore. Some of the notable uh, projects that Engineer Lee has done includes the Zero Energy Building in BCA at Bradle Campus and the National Library Building. So we hope this exchange uh, this afternoon will allow us to tap on his expertise and experience uh, as a leader in the built environment. Uh, at the end of the interview, we will also take questions from the audience. So you may either uh, type in your question using the chat function or you can use the raise hand function in Zoom uh, if you wish to ask the questions verbally. So without further ado, let's get the grilling going. Okay, okay Engineer Lee, um, I'll start off uh, with some warm-up questions, okay? Sure. So let's take a step back in time. Um, we are, when you first started your career as an engineer, what were the career goals that you set for yourself? Because we're all very curious, you know, how, how have you come this far? <laughs> uh, well, this is going back a, 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 a while. Uh, um, so as a young engineer or a young graduate, uh, um, I guess it might sound a bit silly, but uh, I, I wanted to have fun. I wanted to enjoy my work uh, because at that time I read somewhere that uh, if you enjoy your work, uh, then uh, you end up not having to work the rest of your life because you're just indulging in a, in a hobby. Uh, and well, anyway, that's what they, they wrote uh, mm -hmm. and what I read. and. Uh, I guess it kind of worked out for me because uh, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed the work that I've done uh, over the years, even the difficult times because when you sit back and look back at them, uh, you can appreciate uh, that uh, you were able to get people to work together, people who come forward to help, as well as uh, people who grew together with you uh, through the period. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too at that point in time was, uh, this is in the 70s, a uh, professional degree is very much a passport to the world. Uh, you can get end up working in the world mm -hmm. anywhere. And uh, I guess to a certain extent, I uh, kind of uh, have done that because uh, over the years I worked and lived, uh, or rather lived and worked in about six places wow. uh, and ended up doing projects in about 15 countries. So. Oh, okay. That is quite a interesting sort of sequence of events for me. But of course, actually, to be on a more serious side, um, one of the things that I was always wanting to do was uh, being a professional was to try and do whatever I do properly. Mm. Uh, uh, no shortcuts. Uh, but at the same time, of course, be as innovative and as efficient and mm. as productive as possible, right. uh, especially uh, in the companies or the people that I lead. Yeah. Right. You mentioned in the, being innovative, right? So we know that innovation is a very critical element of uh, engineering. And I believe you have been advocating a lot of innovation in your work. So can you share with us some examples on the type of innovation that you have done uh, or pushed for in your career? And why is innovation so important to you? Okay, well, Connie, fundamentally, I think the driver for me was um, Nobody owes us a living. Mm. Uh, so why should any client or customer give you a project, give you his work to do? Uh, 
uh, it must be because you are different. Mm. There's something that you can do that others cannot do. And in order for you to do the things that others cannot do, you need to innovate from what, what everyone else is doing. Right. Uh, so <clears throat> if you, you, you know, especially when, in, when I came to Singapore and worked, started working here, uh, the market was very much and still is focus mm. on competition on fees mm. and uh, in the firm that I started as a director here, uh, Becker Carter, Hollings and Ferner, uh, the directors, the three of us were very keen that uh, we, well, all three of us have enjoyed the work that we have done mm. uh, as engineers and we actually wanted to give our people the opportunities to be good engineers, do interesting work. Mm. Uh, and to have some fun doing it. Yeah. Uh, and if you start uh, just competing on fees, what it means is then uh, you will forever be watching the bottom line right. because you don't have very much margin. So we thought it's better to go the other way, which was to go and equip ourselves with technology and skills and design ideas. Mm. Uh, or design project execution ideas that few other people could copy or emulate. Right. Uh, and then when we then go to a client, uh, we are able to show them those and also what adds value to them. Uh, and by that, we can at least keep to the fee that we ask for. Mm. Uh, and in time to come, as they get to know us and we could produce value for them in their projects, then we can perhaps then also work up a premium. Right. And that premium then allows us to reinvest in the work that we do, allow the people that, who work for us to do innovative things within the company so that we can then present the other differentiators in the projects going forward. Right. Uh, so that seemed to have worked out quite well for us. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 it sort of, you know, in a way it's a virtuous cycle because once you do something better, then you attract or you start ending up working on projects mm. that are more in that area of work. And then especially if we get a bit more of a reputation when we internationalize, mm. it was also easier for us because we were seen as the, well, one of the authorities on some of the work that we do. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a much better outcome overall. I mean, was it tough in the beginning? Like... Oh yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, because you know, uh, you start from the same square yeah. as everyone else. Correct. Uh, so we needed to really look and see what are the things that clients value. Mm. And in fact, one of the things that we found was uh, very, well, we started in the mechanical electrical engineering area right. before moving on to include civil structural work. Okay. Uh, and in the M&E work in the 70s, uh, everyone was just doing the project. Mm. And very few people were, were sort of worried about operations and maintenance. I came from a slightly different background. I started off working, when I started off working, besides working on buildings, I was actually doing power plant and industrial projects. Right. So I was very much into the operations and maintenance side. Oh. Uh, so <laughs> I can still remember some of the clients, earlier clients that we had, when I asked if I could see their O&M or their operations people. It yeah. was like, why do you want to do that? Here are our projects people. Talk to them. They'll tell you what the project needs. Yeah. I say, well, but in M&E is different because you have to look after that building for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Right. And I need to know how they're going to maintain those buildings mm. because then we will design it the way they need to operate it. Mm. And each company, each developer is different in the way that they operate their buildings. Mm. Right. So, so you really tried to understand the whole uh, life cycle of the building and That's address right. the, the issues that are required. That's right. Yeah. So um, were there any other challenges you encountered you know, when driving these changes and innovation? And you know, how has leadership played a part in steering <laughs> these changes? Okay, well, um, I was the in the company and we were a very small firm when I joined. We were less mm. than 20 people, uh, but they had been very close-knit. And uh, people are always very resistant to change. And I can still remember about six months after I joined the company, uh, five or six of the longest serving staff yeah. trooped into the managing director's office 
and told him that you have to get rid of this terrible fellow. <laughs> you know, he's changing everything. He want us to do things in a different way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, Ken Yang, who's the managing director, he said he's, he's a very wise person. He said mm. to them, well, why do you think he's wanting to change this, the way we are doing things? You know, is he doing it because he wants to be, because he wants to be, uh, make a big name for himself? And they look at him and say, no. Is he making it easier for you to do work? Mm, yes. Uh, you know, it sort of went through that level. And Ken Yang was very good. I mean, uh, Ken Yang knew the people. I yeah. didn't. Uh, but he got me in because he wanted me to help change uh, what we were doing at that point in time. Uh, and, and, and this was in the, in the 80s. And uh, so uh, we worked together. Mm. And it was quite interesting that... Uh, in the end, uh, after another 10 years of me being there, uh, when we brought another round of changes, and this was being brought on because we merged with our overseas group, yeah. and we brought a whole lot of new practices from overseas, mm. uh, they then started defending the systems that I put in place <laughs> because they didn't want to change from that. This is what we want. <laughs> you don't come and change this. Yeah. So I then have to step in again and say, guys, uh, you better change because, you know, I can't go and ask all my friends who run all the other companies in Singapore to not change yeah. and not improve themselves because you guys in Becker don't want to change. Right. You know, you if you don't change, you will become the T-Rex that become the lizard yeah. that people step on. Because if you don't uh, innovate and improve yourself, uh, other people will overtake you. Mm. And then you will you'll not be anywhere in the race at all. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so you also shared on uh, opportunities for accelerating um, climate action and sustainability in this year's IBW. Mm -hmm. So in your opinion, how can the sector apply innovation to push for greater sustainability? I think the key thing that we have to do uh, in the whole thing is to uh, change our mindsets. Mm. Um, in nature, uh, there is actually no waste. Uh, all the, there are byproducts, right? And all the byproducts. So you know, even even uh, a chicken uh, a hen, the droppings, right? The chicken poo that is a byproduct, mm. and that by, byproduct is actually the input, the raw material for the vegetable farmer, because it becomes the fertilizer for him. So if we actually emulate uh, what is happening in nature, and nature, of course, is sustainable because it has billions of years of evolution and is able to keep on improving itself. So if we can learn those lessons, uh, then we should change our mindset and there's actually nothing that should be waste. Hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, what I was talking about in the IBW uh, uh, session was to share that uh, within any uh, within the National Environment Agency, we've been re-looking really at the Samarkau landfill. Uh, I think you have heard in the news that uh, we will be finishing the Samarkau landfill uh, by 2035. And if that happens, then we we'll build Samarkau number two, which will cost us quite a lot of money, and also use up valuable space. So what we are now looking at is can change Samarkau into, uh, instead of landfill, a transit storage facility. And instead of taking everything out there, we aggregate the materials that we take out because every single stream of the material, if we look at ways of treating it, we will be able to use it as the raw material for something else, whether it's for construction material use or, you know, even in the end, if say the material is very contaminated, say with zinc, very high content of zinc. If the content of zinc exceeds the content of zinc and zinc ore that you take out from the ground, mm. you then have a few hundred tons of zinc ore to sell to the smelters for them to smelt down into zinc right. and get the zinc back out again, for instance. Yeah. Right. So I think what we need to do in terms of innovation is always revisit our mindsets and think about, hey, why do I think this way? And is there another way of looking at it and seeing how we can change the way we manage certain things. And once you do that, there will be a certain level of value for that. 
And if there's value, you can always go and sell it and make a decent living for yourself and your people. Yeah. I, I mean, I have noticed that and it's always about uh, you know, re-looking critically at what the current situation and yes. um, not taking the status quo for granted, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, when you shared in the IBW, I was really quite interested. I mean, I was quite intrigued by the whole idea of, you know, this whole zero waste and circular economy. Yes, yeah. and, and, and actually, by the way, we have actually seen a lot of people ask us, uh, do you have a, a circular economy in Singapore? Mm. And everyone said, no, we have so much things, which is true. Yeah. But actually, in the construction sector, we have achieved circular economy uh, for more than 10 years, I don't know, 15 years now. 99% of our construction and demolition waste yeah. is recycled. Yeah. In fact, we are so successful in doing that, that uh, we are even taking uh, the waste from other industry and using it into our construction material. For like, so for like instance, the shipbuilding industry generates 300,000 tons, 200,000 tons of uh, copper slag, which mm. they use for sandblasting the mm. paint. Uh, when they finish using that after three or four rounds, the particles are no longer sharp enough to be effective. Uh, we take that, we wash it, and we use it as a substitute for sand. Right. So instead of 300,000 tons of waste a year, we suddenly have 300,000 tons of, Materials. of, <laughs> oh. of sand that awesome. we don't need to buy. Yeah. You know, it's actually there for us. So, so it's very much how we look at it, and then we go and look for ways of doing it. But it needs a lot of things to be done within the industry because uh, the BCA has to agree that this can be used in, stru in, in structural use, mm. uh, that it actually uh, doesn't have a negative impact on the rest of the concrete and all that. Mm. Uh, 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 and the industry has to be able to make a living mm. because the price that you are prepared to pay for it must be enough to cater for the treatment that you need to do. Mm. So it, it is always a, a commercial price point that you have to think about. It's not just the technical side of things. Hmm. Right? Okay. Right. So um, throughout your career, you would have encountered numerous um, challenges and crises. So, I mean, we know of uh, you know, the economic crisis has happened over the years, um, supply chain or even technical perspectives. What would you suggest for other leaders to do um, to walk their organizations through these unforeseen circumstances? I think uh, to be a leader, you okay. What does it mean to be a leader? Yeah. Uh, to be a leader a means you, are, <laughs> you you you. <laughs> but for me, anyway, when I was running the business, uh, I am. It means I'm responsible for a few hundred mortgages wow. that I have to pay every month. Mm. Uh, the 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 livelihood of a, a few a couple of thousand children, and 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 people. So you. Your thinking and your behavior changes because of that. Because you cannot say, oh, I just do whatever I like. Yeah. Because if you do something and it doesn't work, it actually has impact on the people that work with us. Mm. Uh, so I think key thing is we need to be prepared. And the way to be prepared, I guess, uh, being an engineer, <laughs> we look at it maybe a bit uh, systematically, uh, means for, for me is to know your business. Uh, to collect data, mm. uh, to understand the data, uh, to look at the trends, uh, and then, and that is a continuous process right. that you need to have within your business. And then after that, of course, there is a lot of discussion with your fellow team mm. members, and uh, building consensus. Yeah, because not you cannot do any, anything by yourself. It has to be the whole team coming around with you. And be open because even the youngest member of the team might come up with a good idea. Mm. Uh, and you know, within the backer group, we have always say, look, it is not Mr. Lee or Mr. Go or Mr. Leong's idea, but it is a backer idea. Right. Yeah, we don't care who it originates from. We put it into the pot, and then we grind away at it and we polish it. Uh, then it becomes the backer idea or the backer system, and then we implement it. Right. Uh, and if you get that level of consensus. Uh, then, of course, you get a lot of buy-in. Uh, the other thing that, of course, we did was uh, uh, together with our overseas partners, we were very keen that uh, we become an uh, employee-owned company. Mm. So uh, we instituted that sort of in the late 90s, early 2000s onwards. Uh, 
uh, so that today about a third of our people are shareholders. Okay. So literally the company belongs to the staff. <laughs> uh, so in a way that helps us a lot because uh, you know when you have a problem, the most important thing is uh, the person facing the problem owns the problem. And if he owns the company, he owns the problem. <laughs> so that's, that's a good way of, them. that's a good, yeah, it empowers as well as it also gives them that sense of um, belonging and ownership. ownership. Uh, and of course, at the same time, the more senior guys like us yeah. uh, needs to also, we are not the owners, we are not the bosses. We are fellow shareholders mm. and fellow workers. Uh, we just that we might have a bigger responsibility yeah. because we were the ones who probably have a bit more years or a bit more capability or had a bit more training mm. given to us. Mm. Uh, so we carry that thing. Uh, yeah. And then when we are finished with it, then we step aside yeah. and let the others go forward with it. Right. So that, that has been something that we found has worked very, very well for us. Mm. So yes, uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, if you are thinking of how to share the ownership of your company and your and your problems, uh, <laughs> I will be quite happy to talk to you and, <laughs> and share with you some of the things that you might have to do to to set up. But it's actually a long term long term thing. You cannot do it overnight. Uh, you cannot say I want to re I want to retire next year. I do it now. No, you need to start like where you are now. You know, when you're in your thirties and your forties. Uh, and you're to retire in your 60s, you start doing it when you're in your 40s, start get, gathering your people around together. Oh. Because it, it is a total mindset change, mm. again, from the normal way of operating. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was just curious, like, I mean, when you, you, you try to uh, initiate changes within a big organization, I mean, uh, what, what, how, how would the starting point be? Um, like, do you start small and then? Okay, I, 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 always, I always believe in looking for things that has value. Mm. What's the value uh, part of it? If it is something that actually is very valuable yeah. uh, and will, or create a lot of value, uh, then you will be easier to get people to come together to work on it. Mm. And of course, the rewards are there. Yeah. So like, for instance, um, uh, when I first joined the firm, we have done quite a few projects. But, oh, okay, let me give another different example. Yeah. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, submissions was used to be checked by the departments, ah, by the yeah. agencies. So in those days, they were not agencies, they were departments. Hmm. And it used to be quite draconian. You go in, they have this five-page checklist, and they will tell you all the things that are wrong, and then you have to go and redo it. Whether you are QP or whatever, they don't care. You do it, and I, and I came here, and I, my people, tell, the people tell me they say, oh, you know, usually you can go three rounds, four rounds, even five rounds. I say, I don't believe that. Come on, this is engineering. Yeah, we should know our work better. We should be able to do something about it. Uh, so I said, I went to see the departments. I asked them, look, would you uh, share with us your checklist? Because then if we do the checking, you will get a much easier job and we can clear it one time. Yeah. And if they look at me, it's kind of surprised. And then one of my staff told me, you know, you're taking away their rice bowls. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay. So I said, okay, in that case, within our files, we have all the written directions. Yeah. All right. On different projects. So let's say, let's take, let's take the water system, the water supply piping system. Why don't we collect the last five projects that we have, the written directions on it, and then we compile a list mm. of all the different comments that they make. That four pages will be starting point of our checklist. Right. And then I give my staff and say, okay, we know what it's about, right? Yeah. Because we know it. They will tell us what we, we know actually what we did in order to pass it the last three times or four times. So, okay, let's check it. And if, if we go through it, you know, if we go in and they give us a, a new comment, mm. we can add it to our list, all right? But if they, but what I can't accept or what we should not be able to accept is that if it is actually on our list, we go in and they give us the same comment right. because we didn't pick it up, right? Because if we have sent it in. Yeah. Well, so the two old staff that we had assured me that you will never ever get it through in one go. Uh, well, in six months' time, we actually did get a job through wow. in one go. Wow. 
because engineering is engineering. Yeah. It, it's either there or it's not there. Yeah. Right? So, so, and that was actually a, a, a big turning point, actually. Remember, I told you about people complaining about me trying to change things. Mm. Uh, and that happened about a year or so after I joined. Uh -huh. And then after that, they said, oh, okay, this guy probably <laughs> knows a little bit of what he's talking about. <laughs> so you, in a sense, I think as a leader or as a new leader, you really need to uh, have some low-hanging fruits. Mm. Uh, look at the ones that has the biggest gains. And this was a big gain because instead of going three times to five times uh, resubmitting, and in those days, we used to have the color the drawings and all that, six sets and all that. Mm. Uh, it was a lot of uh, cost savings and, and, and so on. Yeah. So you, you, in fact, and of course, time savings too. Yeah. And of course, when you go to a client and he suddenly sees that other people take three times to get through and you go through in one time, you know, you are like, must, must be something valuable in you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the next job he wants, he has another job, he'll give it to you, and then the next job. <laughs> mm. So that's the key thing about it. Sorry, I took too long. <laughs> oh, that, that was really helpful for me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, okay, can, so, so we'll move on. Um, yeah, so what are the, uh, some of the key ingredients that you feel leaders should have to consider building resilience in firms and organizations? Um, I, th I think in terms of re re resilience, yeah. uh, it, it is very important to empower the people mm. because uh, otherwise it will be one, one mind or, or the three directors, three, three minds. Whereas if you actually empower the whole team, then you have a couple of hundred people. Each of them are looking out at their own levels. Yeah. Yeah. And also, also there has to be uh, a quite a strong technical backbone. So we built up a very, very strong, uh, what we call a library of solutions mm. that are proven. So if we do something, we work at it until that particular module of design, let's say for instance, the design of a hotel room. Yeah. We work on it until it's right. Because mm. once we got that module right, and we do five variations, any hotel you give me, I can use one of these five to six variations for m and &E services, mm. for instance, and we can fit it in. What that means, of course, is uh, when I get a job, a hotel, I can do a lot of these standardized modules, uh, which might actually take up about, say, 80% of the work. I can do it in 20% of the time. Wow, okay. Because it's plucking from my library of solutions. Yeah. And so that's why a knowledge database is very important mm. so that you can assess it. And that was what I was talking about, gathering data and all that. So it's yeah. technical data. And then uh, you now then have 80% of your design budget that you can then concentrate on all those other innovative things. Mm. This guy come in and he wants a, a ballroom that is you know, super big whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants an uh, uh, audiovisual system that can do this. Uh, again, you know, and he wants the energy efficiency to be down. We can actually then invest our time to go into energy efficiency and make it so, so good mm -hmm. that he, and we can then show to him that each year you are saving probably a few hundred thousand dollars right. uh, in, your, in, your, in your operating costs. So those are things that I think in the end, if we can do that, uh, that really, really helps us to uh, sell ourselves. Yeah. And not just sell yourself, but also deliver. Yeah. Because you, know, you sell yourself, but three years later, the project is finished. <laughs> it has to be delivered. It has to perform to the way that you do. And of course, as, as time passes and we went into the green buildings and all that, we then had to pick up all the additional skills in terms of all the simulations. Mm. Uh, we send people overseas for training mm. uh, so that we can then bring that back, invest in the computer software and so on, as well as the hardware, yeah. because you need more powerful workstations and all that. So uh, partly is investment, partly is capability, but the key part is looking at where always where the value is and picking on those value. Right. And then being able to put it into a package that you can tell the client here, this is something that I think you will be good for you to have. Hmm. And, and of course, uh, the other thing that we were always trying to do was instead of us against the client, facing the client, we were always thinking of ourselves as being his right hand or left hand man. Hmm. You know what I mean? 
any client will prefer to have his own engineering department if he can afford it. Yeah. But he, he doesn't want to. He wants to be able to choose. So, but that doesn't mean that, and also that's being professional, right? Mm. We, we are here as your man. I'm here as your professional to help you in the professional part of the work that needs to be delivered. So I think that's the other thing that we have to do. Mm. So under your leadership, uh, Becca expanded globally into new frontiers such as uh, China and also within ASEAN countries like Indonesia, Myanmar and Malaysia. Um, what kind of strengths do um, you think Singapore firms and professionals can leverage on to sell in this market? Well, the Singapore brand name is actually extremely useful for us. Mm. Uh, wherever we go, uh, uh, if you are from Singapore, first of all, they recognize it. I can still remember we were doing this project in Jakarta and uh, 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 this client got us. And then one of my guys at that time from Singapore, uh, we had to send him, he, he was from Malaysia originally, mm. but we were opening our Malaysia office, so we sent him back up to KL right. to anchor in our Malaysia our KL office. And then when we got into the job, I got him to go from KL to Jakarta. Wow. To the job. Yeah. <laughs> and immediately my Indonesian client called me out and said, Jose, what's this? I, I, I hired a Singaporean consultant. Now you're trying to pump me off onto a Malaysian uh, consultant. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. So I had to explain that uh, this chap had actually worked for us for 10 years in Singapore. Mm. Uh, and he was actually very good. That's why we stationed him in KL now. Mm. Uh, but because this particular project that he was doing, uh, needed that kind. We we're, were putting in seven generators, right. uh, electrical generators for him because they were having blackouts in Jakarta ah. in the early 90s. Okay. And we were having to put in that thing. And so uh, he was the best person for that. Uh, and that's why, and that only by that was he mollified. Because otherwise he said, hey, I hire a Singapore consultant and then now I'm getting a KL chap. Uh, so, so the Singapore brand name is very important, actually. Yeah. Then the other things that we did together, like the green buildings and green mark and all that, raise our profile. Uh, you know, uh, as we gain recognition internationally for our green buildings and what we're able to do in terms of green building work, uh, when we go off to China, in fact, uh, <laughs> there's this story I, I, I can tell. It's, it's not uh, one, one project, but it's a combination of a few projects. But essentially, it goes around like this. Client says to me, actually, I don't need you. You know, you come from a small place like Singapore. Uh, what can you show me? I got the best from America and Europe do, wanting to work for me. Yeah. And this is in the 2003, 2004, 2005, you know, even mm. then. But I think when I was able to say to them, uh, but I can design you buildings that are able to save you $2 million a year. And you see that I think, <laughs> and then I was go able to then go in and explain to them like, hey, uh, this is what we do, this is how we do it, this is how we do the simulations. Mm -hmm. And then we put in these things and we will work with the architects uh, as well as the other people to make sure that your facade and all that comes into place. And so you, you then get your next job and then mm -hmm. you get the next job. So I think these are things that we need to be able to see what is the value for the client to get someone from another country mm. and why you and why not someone with a bigger name yeah. in America or Europe. Yep. And of course, the other thing that we can tell them is we know the way you use your buildings and the way we use our building. Mm. The people who maintain your buildings and the people who maintain our buildings in Singapore, they might be planting rice six months ago. Whereas the consultants, the engineers who come from America and Europe, uh, the buildings, the people who maintain their buildings, sometimes their fathers and grandfathers were maintaining similar buildings. So your staff and our staff are different. Yeah. Your, your staff and our staff are the same, okay. different from the American maintenance people. So the buildings you design, especially for mechanical electrical work, you need to understand what can be maintained mm. uh, by the level of staff that we have. Uh, in China, in right, Singapore, right. in Indonesia, in Myanmar. So those are things that we have to look at. It, it's not, you know, our business is not just one facet. It's multifaceted. Mm. It's multi-layered. And so we need to be very knowledgeable about our business so that we can do it properly. Yeah. And we also should be able to then explain it to our clients, uh, including the, especially the international ones, because they don't know you. Uh, so that you are able to then get into the market. Mm. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, thanks for that. Um, clearly, so clearly from our introduction of you earlier, we know that you are a man of uh, many important hats. So what prompted you to contribute towards the wider development of the sector and what fueled um, your energy to do so much? <laughs> well, <laughs> well uh, as I was growing our business uh, and building it up, uh, I get a lot of help from a lot of people. Mm. Uh, uh, part of the things that we did uh, was where we try to do more innovative designs and buildings, quite often it doesn't follow the code. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's be, and in those days, it was a very uh, uh, prescriptive yeah. stand, uh, codes. Uh, so we often had to go and see the more senior people in the departments mm. and talk to them. And they were very helpful uh, because once you explain the engineering behind them and say, look, you know, actually this is a much better system and I can do it better. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they understand and they, they, and then of course we were then able to, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, do projects for our clients that no one else has done that way before. Mm. So that, 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 that was a, a good, good, good outcome because then the clients get the benefit of it. Uh, like I think we were the, one of the first companies who were able to put the electrical substations not on the ground floor, uh -huh. uh, but on the on onto the basement. Right. Uh, this was in Bugis Junction in 1993. Mm. Uh, for instance, that's 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 an example. And of course, you know, uh, for shopping mall, you want your ground floor to be shopping space where you can rent out for tens of dollars yeah. uh, per square foot per month. So that's a good outcome for them. It was a good outcome for us because you get the next and next and next and next job right. from that particular client. Uh, uh, but we got to know the people. And then, of course, when they were wanting to adjust codes and things like that, mm. they turn around and we start joining their committees. So mm. that's how I started. Uh, and so I thought it's always a good thing to pay forward, uh, in, in a way, pay back. Uh, I got helped. Uh, if I can help, then let's go ahead with it. And of course, the other thing too, those of us who are in the industry and you know, we are in the industry and if we know the issues, if we, if we don't come forward and get involved in helping to solve them, uh, then the outcome won't be as good. And then we only have ourselves to blame. Mm -hmm. So I think also for those of you in the audience, you are all budding and growing. Uh, I would really encourage you to get involved in the industry uh, work with the other people, you know, a rising tide rises, uh, sort of a rising tide leaves all boats. If you build your own boat, you can build it as tall as you like, but if the tide is low tide, you still cannot get very high. But if the tide is also rising, then everyone goes up. Mm. You know, I mean, you know, if you go somewhere else today, uh, they always say, okay, Singaporeans, you, you guys do sustainable design. You don't even have to say that. They know it. And then you can say, but I do even more sustainable than the usual sustainable. <laughs> so that's where you can get your job. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, in a way, there is uh, uh, benefits for us as well in, 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 in pushing. Because if we try, you see, yeah, we are now, I think, able to be, I think, about 60% better in energy efficiency than when we started out in 2005 for Greenmark. Yeah we would never have got here if the whole industry didn't get behind it you know yeah for us you know we can now talk a super low energy building and all that in singapore uh if we have not done the journey from 2005 we would not be here mm. today all right uh so it is a benefit to the whole industry it's a benefit to the to the environment uh it's also a benefit for our businesses yeah yeah, I think that takes a lot of uh, resolve to really push for what you believe in, right? <laughs> well, if you have fun doing it, it's okay. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. I'll just have one last question before we um, uh, put it up to the audience. So, in your career, you have worked with and developed many younger colleagues. So, what do you see in a younger leader? Um, what kind of qualities, in, in your opinion, must they possess to be a good leader? Okay, um, <laughs> I asked it a question similar to this once, and I said, you know, um, 
actually, when you are, when I was young, when I started, I was very keen to learn new things. Uh, but I know, you know, quite often we see among younger people, people are always trying to get out of doing the hard things. Mm. If there's a problem project, they see whether they can. Uh, I don't know whether you use, still use the same colloquial term. I, I see them okay. or ella, <laughs> yeah. And then after that, they say, "Wah, hang ah, you know, I didn't, I didn't get arrowed there, you know, I escaped, you know, I see them and I didn't get arrowed." Yeah. But take a step back uh, when you say when you're in such a situation, uh, what have you done actually? You have just missed the opportunity of your life time to go and learn something difficult. Yeah. If you get arrowed to do something. But your boss is actually right behind you, right? Mm. Because if he arrow you and you fail, it also reflects on him. All right. So if you go in with your eyes open, ready to learn, and you keep on coming back to say, "Boss, ah, you know, you asked me to do this, and then there's this other issue," you know, he he has to come in and help you. Yeah. All right. And then you have it inside you. Mm. The next time, uh, something like that happen, or even not not even something like that. Something bigger happened. You have been there and done it. You can take the next thing. Otherwise, you would have been there and allied it and saw someone else do it, or even hear of someone else doing it, but you actually don't know how to do it. Yeah. And when you have to do it, what are you going to do? Ella <laughs> <Ela> again. <laughs> <laughs> so you will then end up all your whole life a series of Ella. And then at the end of it, you say, "Hang on, I didn't have to do all that." Whereas the other guy who actually got arrowed and all that, he will say, "Hang on," and his hang will be a bigger hang than yours, because he would have gained the experience. He would have digested and assimilated everything.、Mm. He will be a much better architect, engineer, contractor, whatever. Yeah.、Uh, so I think,、uh, you know, if you are young, you make a you make a mistake. And it's a total mistake and a disaster. People say, "Okay, he's young. It's all right." If you are another ten years more and you make the same mistake,、uh, you won't be forgiven.、Mm. All right. So I think、uh, take take risks, lah. You know, and you know, if someone arrow you, he's actually going to have to look after you. So、mm. go ahead and do it. I, I I think that's important for the younger people. Uh, because those are opportunities that actually you don't get. You、mm-hmm. know, you only comes. You have to be at the right time, at the right place, and the right person. Then you got it done. Of course, if you go in and your bo- and your boss then abandon you. Yeah.、Uh, there are two things. Ah,、uh. you could say, "Alam, boss abandoned me. What to do? You resign, lor." <laughs> Right, because as a young person, you can always resign, go somewhere else. Okay.、Uh, but of course, if you stick by it, and I actually had this experience,、uh, you stick by it. They said, "Never mind.、Uh, after all, what can I do? What can they blame me for? You know, I can just do my best、mm. and carry through it." Yeah. And at the end of that, you suddenly realize actually it's not too bad, lah. You know, things got delayed a bit. Things were not as good as they could be. But well, they can't blame you, right? You are a five years experienced person when you should be a ten years experienced person doing it. Yeah. And but that guy Charbot. Yeah. <laughs> and that was actually what happened to me. A chap who was more experienced was leading the job. He actually did a problematic contractual arrangement. Oh. And then when the thing started becoming difficulty, he escaped. Right. And I was stupid enough to stay on. <laughs> you know, you yeah. Either way, like at one stage I thought I was stupid, but at the end of it, I thought okay. In my stupidity, I was actually, in a way, being quite smart、mm. because I stuck through it. Everyone was sympathetic to me, <laughs>、uh, and when I when we get out to the end, we did finish off the job. Yeah,、uh, the client was very happy、yeah. because he realized, of course, what could have happened、mm. if I haven't sort of stuck on. Because otherwise, there'll be no one who know anything about the job. Yeah,、uh, and it would have taken maybe another six to ten months for someone else. To come in and pick it up, you see. Right. So, so、uh, bad things can happen, but good things can come out of it、uh, if you work away at it、mm. and、uh, don't give up. Yeah. 
So I think to be a leader is not to give up. <laughs> <laughs> and not to be afraid of challenges, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks so much for the insights that you have shared. And uh, we will now open the discussion to our audience online. So um, just give me a moment. Okay, so let's see. Well, if any of you uh, wish to speak verbally, you can uh, use the raise hand function. I'll just um, look through the chat. Okay, um, we have one question from uh, Amos. Um, he's asking, apart from mindsets, uh, what else do you think is hampering the adoption of innovation in projects, um, procurement frameworks and contracts? Um. Well, I guess uh, a major thing is everyone is actually very, very busy. Hmm. Uh, our, our industry actually operates on making everybody work maybe 110, 120% loading. Yeah. Uh, so you really don't have enough time to do a lot of things really. So you, and so because of that, people don't want to change because they see it as additional work and so on and so forth. So when you want to do anything to change, it must be a great big time saving that mm. will result. So you have to have a, it might be a hump while you train up on new software or new uh, technology, like learning how to do simulation to, for sustainable buildings and mm -hmm. all. Because if you don't do those simulation, then you always have the problem of how, whether it will perform or not. So, so you need to have something that has a big benefit. Yeah. All right. So, um, <laughs> Amos, I'm going to give you a slightly different answer than what you expect, I think. Uh, one thing that we are trying to do at uh, the ITM uh, is to digitize, digitalize the, the whole industry. Yeah? And uh, chairing the IDD steering committee, I can share some uh, statistics. Uh, in Singapore, we are finding that uh, about 20% of the projects are just under 20% of the projects are more than 5,000 square meters. And because of that, under the BCA rules, you need to submit them in BIM. Mm. So you need, to, you need to go and get digital skills and really digitalize. Yep. Uh, so, and what we've, we have also just got the data from IMDA is that uh, about 80% of our companies in Singapore are not really digitalized in a very serious way. That means they don't do beam and things like that, yeah. even today. Yeah. All right. So what it actually means is that about 80% of our companies are working on less than 10% of And changing will be that if you don't do, someone else is doing it. And if you don't do, you'll be the lizard that will get stepped on because you have not evolved, mm. you have not changed. Uh, whereas the others who have changed, uh, they will go from the T Rexes to the Homo sapiens, they will take over the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, <laughs> life is like that, it's hard, uh, but 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 it is a uh, uh, hard. Thing that you know, if you are not able to be leading edge or close to the leading edge, uh, it's very difficult for you to be working where the value is. Uh, and our industry is very stuck in this way, where you have about 10 15 percent of the companies doing about 90 plus percent of the value of the work. You know, so do keep this in mind. Uh, in what you are doing and look at where the trends are and, you know, keep yourself ahead of the curve. Mm. I, I'm, I'm retired now, so I can't, that's, I retired because I can't keep up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're sharing with us uh, many 
valuable um, insights and experiences, which we, I think we really appreciate. Any more questions from the audience? Um, you know, feel free to just uh, uh, raise your hand or you can even just unmute us so that we can unmute you to ask questions. Yeah, if you want to have a verbal discussion, it'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Not I uh, will go back to my own set of questions. <laughs> okay. So um yeah, so so why do you think uh leadership is important in developing the entire ecosystem beyond a single organization and uh, how can we have a you know this great collective leadership to strengthen our b business well um i think digitalization is actually or idd integrated digital delivery is actually one example mm. uh if, the, if if you have only one architect doing bin and then the structural engineers, the M&E engineers, the contractors don't use BIM. It's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, so all of you have to get together. But we are all in different companies. So that's why it has to be an industry effort. It has to be an industry. That's why there's an industry steering committee to get all of us uh, involved in it. Uh, the other thing also is uh, if we were to do BIM and every one of us follow our own standard, we won't be able to interchange models. Mm. We want to. We want to. We won't be able to be interoperable. Yeah. For instance, so we need to come together to set standards, and allow us to do it. Actually, the other thing uh, a lot of people are saying is very hard to go uh, into beam and all that, and to standardize and all that. But um, by the way, you know, this industry actually has also a success story that very few people talk about. Uh, back in 2003, we started, we did e-submission. Mm. Uh, and e-submission was only possible because we standardized all of our 2D beam, uh, sorry, 2D CAD drawings. Mm. Uh, we, in fact, today we are still one of the few countries, in fact, maybe the only country uh, which has gone into a national standard for all their 2D drawings. Mm. And, you know, if you don't standardize your 2D drawings, architect give the drawing to the structural engineer. Structural engineer has to tidy it up before he can work on it. And then structural engineer gives the drawings back to the architect, the CAD files back to the architect. Architect has to tidy it up before they can, they can, because they don't use the same name, file naming conventions and all that. Yeah. But with uh, CP83, Singapore standard CP83 that came out in 2002, mm. we were able to just interchange drawings uh, architect, engineer, contractor, nobody need to worry about uh, be, being able to read or understand or trying to clear up things. And uh, what people didn't realize was that actually resulted over 10 years. We, we actually did a study because uh, that's in the International Standards Organization uh, asked the Singapore Standards Council back in 2013 to do a study on, on, on I have two minutes <laughs> uh, to, to, to do the, 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 the a study on what are the economic benefits of standardizing the way you work in the industry. Yeah. Um, and we, so we, we picked CP83 and we went and studied it. And we actually work out that very conservatively just for the architects and engineers, not counting the, uh, the, 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 the uh, contractors, architects, engineers, and the submitting agencies. Uh, we saved three hundred and twenty million dollars in ten years, from two thousand and three to two thousand and twelve, and that represents, uh, on a yearly basis, a four percent increase in productivity for those uh, for those uh, for those professions. So you can imagine, if we haven't had that, we would have been much worse off in being able to cope with the increased workload and the increase fee competition yeah. because fee competition is very tight all through this period. Uh, so this is the things that we actually need to look at that you know, we have been there, done it. We have actually done one round 
of digitalization, going to e-submission. Mm. Uh, but we need to go to the next level uh, of BIM and transaction uh, platforms, uh, as well as uh, workflow platforms. Because the companies who do that uh, are so much more effective that if you are not digitalized, they will eat your lunch. You know, and if uh, your fellow work, uh, colleague is able to do all the digital programs and all that, and you are not, he will eat your lunch. Not that he's intentionally doing it, but he's just going to do it because he's going to be able to do the work yes, multiples course. of times faster than you. We are having to finish. Okay. Um, last question for oh. today. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, leveraging on uh, what you just shared, you know, how uh, we really need to move uh, in towards uh, digitalization. Um, so what are the um, vital traits uh, leaders need to have in uh, dr driving this transformation in the B sector and, um, you know, to strive towards the aspirations of the ITM or even beyond it? Yeah. I think, I think we need to have vision. Uh, we need to, I think we need to see what it is that we want to have uh, in, the, in the end uh, and then work backwards. Uh, you know, I think there's no choice about it, isn't it, guys? Uh, look 10 years down the road, look five years down the road, look even two years down the road. Uh, we are going to have much less labor. We can't have three, four hundred thousand uh, foreign workers working on our construction sites. Uh, we probably can get certain level of S passes, employment passes, uh, because uh, we will need those people to do the uh, professional and the technical work for us. Uh, but we need to be a lot more efficient. We need to be a lot more productive. And the only way we can do it is, well, we've got it there, uh, the digital delivery. And the other one is the productivity through design for manufacturing and assembly. Because first of all, these two coming together will allow us to lower the manpower requirements. On top of that, uh, if we actually do quite a bit of our work in PPVC, uh, it, what it will mean is we will move the work, first of all, to a factory floor, where we will immediately get a higher productivity gains uh, from going to manufacturing rather than construction. Because in manufacturing, your factory floor is there all the time. In construction, every floor we go out, we rebuild a new factory floor mm. to manufacture our building. To produce our building and on top of that we are going to be able to shift the factory uh, the, the, the modules to be manufactured in countries where the labor is actually there so they don't have to come to singapore they will stay there with their families they'll be happy there they are not here uh and in large numbers and then their social issues and problems the other part of it is really look guys all of our construction materials are imported and many people don't want to export their sand gravel to us. So if we were to move the manufacturing of these modules to the countries where we can use their sand, we can use their cement and their gravel, and then they export the completed modules to us, we will solve also the materials problem as well as the labor problem. So I think we need to have a vision of what we are wanting to do what does, the, what does the industry have to be in five years, 10 years time? And then we then have to work towards how to get there. And if we get together and discuss it, I'm sure we'll be able to do so. Thanks, thanks so much. So guys, back home, <laughs> any last questions that you wanna say? Uh, if not, we will close the session. can unmute yourselves, you know. No? Okay. So with that, thank you so much, Engineer Lee, for sharing your valuable experience and insights with us. And we 
definitely look forward to uh, hearing more from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope I, I hope I did produce some good satay. You're going to grill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I personally I really enjoyed the session. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so to, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. So to our audience back home, uh, thank you for tuning in. You'll receive a feedback form after logging out. So kindly fill in the form so that we can have your feedback as well. Uh, so be sure to keep out uh, keep a look out for the next session of Distinguished Fellows in Conversation series in your email. So thanks and everyone stay safe. Bye. <laughs> Thank <coughs> you.